Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar uh, in which I will be introducing the basics from uh, acoustic reflex measurements. But first I'll introduce myself, my name is Jos Huyne, I'm one of the audiologists working for the Instroacoustics Academy. Um, today's learning objectives are to understand what an acoustic reflex is and then how to measure the acoustic reflex. Now there's two tests that I will describe, so it's the acoustic reflex threshold and the reflex decay test. And of course, very important, I would like to uh, share with you why the acoustic reflex measurements are such a valuable tool in clinical practice. And at the end I will also demonstrate how the acoustic reflexes can be measured. Not to forget, uh, today's webinar is dealing with a topic within the tympanometry environment, so it would be very useful if you have seen the tympanograms introduction webinar before viewing this webinar. You can find it on our website academy.interacoustics.com and then go to the webinar section. Okay, let's start talking about acoustic reflexes. Here we see a picture of the human ear. I've used this uh, before, so I would like to draw your special attention to the stapedius muscle, which is basically holding the stapes and that part of the ossicular chain in, in its place. Um, yeah, let's see how this is embedded in our head. So here we see the ear on the outside, also the cochlea gets connected to our brain. And of course we have two ears, so I will also show the uh, other side. Now, the acoustic reflex is about what happens if we present a very loud sound to the ear. So here we see a very loud sound entering the ear. Um, the cochlea uh, in, in normal situation will pick up and send activity to the cochlear nucleus. Now the cochlear nucleus passes on uh, the information to the superior olivary complex and from there information travels up to the brain where you become aware eventually that there is sound but at the same time it branches off to the facial nerve nucleus and from there uh, a signal is sent through the seventh nerve towards the stapedius muscle which will then contract and by this contraction the positioning of the ossicular chain becomes different and thereby the transfer of sounds through the middle ear becomes different. Also from the cochlear nucleus there is also a branch going up to the other side to the superior olivary complex of the opposite side and from there also the opposite side uh, uh, gets activated so that the acoustic reflex takes place in both ears simultaneously. Okay, so far so good. Now we have a look at all the uh, the complete pathway that is involved um, in the acoustic reflex measurements, and uh, the com uh, yeah this all together we then call the acoustic reflex arc. Let's start explaining how we can measure if the acoustic reflex is present or not. We all always start by doing a tympanogram. So we put a probe in the ear where we present a probe tone, then we start changing the pressure uh, and the starting point of the tympanogram is at a positive pressure. Um, we change the pressure while we measure how easy it is for sound to pass through the middle ear and then when the tympanogram is ready we place ourselves on the uh, peak of the tympanogram. So we want to measure the acoustic reflex while uh, the pressure is the same in the ear canal as in the middle ear cavity. Now, when measuring the acoustic reflex, what we introduce is a timeline. We are going to monitor over time what happens to that peak of the tympanogram. And on the timeline, I already indicated that at the, the red part, um, we will present a very loud sound in addition to the probe tone into the ear. Let's see that happening. So we see the loud sound being presented and when it is off again. Now I'll show that a few times. Um, what we see is that uh, during the contraction 
of the stapedius muscle, the, the peak of the tympanogram is pulled down. It becomes less easy for the probe tone to pass through the middle ear system. Um, once more, the same figure. Now, it is also the case that, the de uh, that there is a little bit of delay be between the onset and the offset of the sound, as well as the onset and offset of the contraction of the acoustic reflex. But this is the acoustic reflex. Now, he here we can have a look at the pathway um, highlighted that is active when there is this loud sound presented, in this case, to the right ear. Um, when you measure in the right ear while you also present the uh, reflex activator in the right ear, then we talk about an ipsilateral reflex. Now, we can also present the loud sound at the opposite ear from where we test, so we put a probe in the uh, left ear and present the loud sound there. When we measure the reflex in this way, we talk about a contralateral reflex. So those ipsilateral and contralateral reflexes that we can measure. Good. So wh what do we see on the screen when we do this in practice? Um, we see a number of reflex graphs. So firstly, each row of reflexes belongs to one reflex activator. And in th this example we have the 500, 1000 and 2000 Hz with the ipsilateral presentation. Then each column represents a different intensity. We, ca we can see here that, uh, that the um, reflexes were measured at 80, 85 and 90 dB. And also notice that the reflexes in this uh, example, they go into negative direction. That is, the, the, the easiness for the sound to pass through the middle ear is pulled down. But in fact, many people in the world prefer seeing the presence of a reflex to be an upwards movement. For, so those people can flip the graph and look at reflexes in a positive direction. Of course, you've noticed that there is uh, three indications where the graph is uh, made green. This is because the system has detected the presence of a reflex. And the presence of the reflex for the system has something to do with how far is the reflex away from the baseline. Um, most often this is indicated with a deflection value. And the deflection value can be obtained in different ways. Um, one way to do this is to simply look at where is the maximum point of the reflex and the, the maximum deflection is then the deflection value. Um, I think a more appropriate way to do is to look at a region and then take the average deflection for that region. Um, on top of that, uh, at Intraacoustics, we uh, also look at the shape of the curve. So if the shape of the curve is not as expected, the deflection value might be big enough, but it still doesn't get a uh, green indication. If we look at the deflection values in these cases, then we can actually see that the reflexes are also present at lower intensities. And if we look at the corresponding deflection values, we see 0 0.04 for those examples. And what is interesting when talking about reflexes is what is the lowest intensity where we can detect the reflex? And if we want to in, uh, detect the, the reflex threshold, then it's fair to, to uh, highlight these three as the green ones. Now, um, which ones are highlighted is simply a matter of choosing the detection criterion. So if the criterion is set to 0 0.03, then these three would become green. Okay, so that um, that introduces the acoustic reflex threshold. Um, so let's look at the clinical value of reflexes. Uh, to do so, we need to have the acoustic reflex arc in mind. And of course, we'll first have a look at what happens for the normal situation. Um, but in each situation, we will have four measurements with the measurement happening at the right and the left ear and also with the reflex activator happening at the right and the left ear. Now, in the normal situation, of course, we expect the reflex threshold to be normal. The question is then, 
what would be normal values and here we see a publication from 1987 um, where it is indicated that uh, the mean value of reflexes is roughly between 80 and uh, 90 db, db uh, on the ipsilateral side while it is from 85 to 90 db on the contralateral side um, here I didn't show you the standard deviations but there is uh, a standard deviation of roughly uh, 5 to 7 dB so, so anything between 80 and uh, 95 dB could be considered a normal reflex threshold now with uh, the, the uh, reflex activator being broadband noise the BBN in the, in the table then th the threshold is much much lower but it's not frequency specific which some people consider a disadvantage um, but I would see it as an advantage that it's it's not so loud for the patient so it's more com a more comfortable measurement okay so these are the normal reflex thresholds what happens to these when we do not have a normal situation in the ear so the first situation we now look at is a mild to moderate sensorineural hearing loss on either side. What happens, if we think about what happens, for example, if this is at the right ear, is that the activity going to the cochlear nucleus is a little bit less for the soft sound, but it's not at all less compared to normal for the loud sounds. And because reflex and reflexes happen as a reaction on loud sounds, the reflexes are usually not affected by mild to moderate sensorineural hearing, lo hearing losses. So in each box of our table we can write normal, normal reflex threshold. This changes however if we go to slightly bigger sensorineural hearing losses. From 50 dB and above we expect that the um, activity going to the uh, cochlear nucleus is affected it becomes less and the acoustic reflex pathway will only be uh, activated if the um, intensity is raised so the reflex threshold will raise in this case right ear is affected so there it will raise on the left ear it's still normal so that will still be normal the next situation that I would like to describe is a conductive hearing loss on the right ear while the left ear is again completely normal. Now when there is a conductive hearing loss we need to realize that the sound doesn't reach the cochlea with the same intensity as it normally would. It means that the sound is damped so much that in most cases you cannot make the activator loud enough to really cause an activity in the cochlear nucleus. So activating the acoustic reflex pathway from the right ear in this case is, is in for most pathologies uh, mi uh, for most conductive hearing losses that, that's not really possible at the same time if we activate from the left side and we try to measure on the right side um, many pathologies uh, that cause conductive hearing loss they, they cause the, the uh, compliance to be already so low uh, that even though the muscle might be contracting we cannot measure a change. Concluding in our table there is only uh, uh, ipsilateral reflexes on the left side that will show normal and the rest is most likely to be absent. Uh, then very different problem and also uh, not often presenting itself in a clinic is a neurological lesion. There can be uh, lesions at uh, different sites and with a lesion I mean that the neurological pathway is really cut off. So as if we take our scissors and we for example we cut off the, the seventh nerve uh, so that on the right ear um, um, the muscle cannot be told to contract. Well if you do this then uh, um, you can activate reflexes by presenting activators on both sides but you can never measure it on the right ear. Now, another lesion could be a lesion of the 8th nerve which is then causing that 
any uh, presentation to the right ear is not resulting into activity of the cochlear nucleus on the right ear. So in this case we can measure the acoustic reflex on both ears as long as the presentation comes from the left ear, which is shown here. Now, there is a third la lesion where the lesion causes that there is no crossover between the two halves of the brain. With such a lesion it means that in both ears you can do the ipsilateral measurement but you can never cross over and so never get a contralateral measurement and that's shown in this table. So, so much about the neurological lesions. Then another neurological problem um, called retrocochlear pathologies and most often this refers to a, a acoustic schwannoma, something compressing the nerve. This presents itself slightly different. So here we pretend to have acoustic neuroma on the right side. Now what happens is that the activity within the co cochlear nucleus is uh, affected either it's the, the firing is not so uh, it's not really synchrone anymore or uh, there is uh, uh, less nerve firing there is a little bit of variation expected in the acoustic reflex thresholds but most likely the, the threshold is somewhat raised or it's absent when presenting the activator to the right ear while we can measure uh, the acoustic reflex on both ears when we present on the left ear. Now in this case we can do a special test which I already mentioned uh, at the introduction and that is the acoustic reflex decay. F for doing a decay test we first need the acoustic reflex no we first need the acoustic reflex threshold um, so we have a probe in the ear, we find the re reflex threshold and then uh, during the acoustic reflex decay we measure again a reflex but now with an activator 10 dB above the threshold. This is to cause a very easy detectable reflex. Now what we do with this reflex is we change how long we present the sound. So instead of roughly one and a half, two seconds, you would present 10 seconds of activator. So we stretch the timeline. And here we see an example of a normal case. In normal cases, you expect the contraction to hold during the whole presentation. In the higher frequencies, it's also relatively normal to see some decay, but it is only when the decay is more than 50% that it is an indication for uh, retrocochlear pathology. So DK is defined as the difference in deflection at the beginning and at the end of the 10 seconds activator. So an aspect that I have not touched yet is why does the ear have an acoustic reflex? Let's start again by looking at our tympanogram. We, we measured our timp, then we measured over time how the peak of our tympanogram got reduced by the contraction of the stapedius muscle and now we need to realize that this measurement has taken place with a 226 Hertz probe tone. So no matter which activator frequency we used we only looked at the 226 Hertz being reduced and not passing through the middle ear as easy during the contraction of the muscle. Now, if we plot this slightly different in a graph and we, we plot the deflection value and then the 226 hertz frequency, here we see different deflection values for different intensities. So the deflection value becomes a bigger number when we increase the intensity. Now, what happens if we measure this with other probe tones? And here is a graph which I adapted from Feeney and Keef um, that shows how it can look like. And what we see here is that in the lower frequency range the, 
the contraction reduces the intensity that that um, passes through the middle ear system while around 1000 Hertz there is an increase so for those who thought that the acoustic reflex has a protective function this is an indication that that it's not protecting at all frequencies in the same way it's actually doing the opposite around 1000 Hertz now thinking about the evolution of the human ear then you can also wonder why would the ear need protection if you go a few centuries back before the industrialized time there was not really loud sound to be protected from the acoustic reflex has a different function and when you talk yourself you present loud sounds to your own hearing and by having the acoustic reflex contracting while you talk you reduce the uh, lowest frequencies you increase the middle frequencies and that gives you a benefit that while you talk you can still hear your surrounding slightly better low sounds from your own voice would typically mask uh, the other sounds at the higher frequencies coming in the function of the acoustic reflex threshold has to be found in the purpose that it has during your own talking at this point I would like to uh, switch over to my demonstration so I will now uh, connect my Titan and try to do a measurement on my own ear okay so here we see the Titan suite um, we can see a uh, protocol being selected which is called acoustic reflex testing which contains several tests it starts with a tympanogram then it follows with three ipsilateral reflexes, three contralateral reflexes, and it uh, finishes with a DK test. Now, I'll go through it step by step. Okay, so first I need to insert the probe into my ear. And I will also already insert the contraphone in the opposite ear so what we now will see is that uh, I'll measure a tympanogram on the right ear and then when it's done it will automatically measure the reflexes uh, on the right ear as well So what you see during this process is that the system measures uh, the reflex when the reflex is uh, higher than the, the uh, detection criterion which is set at 0 0.02 in this case then it will repeat the measurement now in in many places you would like to see the growth of the reflex function if you would like to do so you could uh, one way to do that is you go into manual testing select the speaker icon and here I could so here I individually selected the boxes which I wanted to measure in addition just to show that there is growth also if you would like to indicate where the reflex threshold is you could do it like this so if you manually indicate the threshold it will remove the detection from the bigger ones now here we see a value of 0 0.02 which is not automatically indicated as a reflex that is because if you look in the detail then probably it is 0 0.016 or 7 and uh, the deflection criterion was set to 0 0.02 um, but the rounded number was big enough but the actual deflection value was not um, let's also measure the contralateral reflexes um, I'm still in manual mode so I can quickly do that by clicking on the graphs
now we see that my contralateral reflexes are relatively poor, shifted up at a higher intensity. So that's why I'll try to measure at even louder intensity. So I got those light louder intensities by, by right mouse clicking on the label. If I would like to include a different stimulus, I could do that like this, for example. And as promised, wideband noise or broadband noise gives a much lower reflex threshold. Okay. Let's now move on to the DK test. We will measure a DK reflex at 1000 Hz. Um, it will be an ipsilateral measurement where we retrieve the reflex threshold at 85 dB. So when uh, doing the DK test, it will suggest to do the measurement at uh, 95 dB. Now we can see that uh, the reflex is uh, more or less constant uh, during the whole presentation. Maybe the baseline shifted slightly up, but this is a nice DK measurement. Let's go back to the presentation and come to a conclusion. Uh, in summary, I would like to, m to say that as long as you keep the acoustic reflex arc in mind, it's pretty easy to make conclusions based on the acoustic reflex measurements. Um, it is of course important to have the table in mind, realize what's ipsilateral contralateral reflexes and where are the normal thresholds to be expected. Then besides doing acoustic reflex thresholds, there is the D DK test. So in, in the audiologic clinic, the reflex testing uh, has a very valuable place and Many people use acoustic reflex tests as standard on every patient. Um, perhaps some of them do not choose to measure the acoustic reflex threshold on each patient, but then often it is at least a screening for um, uh, to show that the reflex can be measured at a higher intensity. Now, perhaps you now have some questions, so uh, we come at the end of our webinar. Okay, thank you. Um, that is a good question. I see Mark is typing. Uh, I have a Titan and it also includes the reflex latency test. Can you say something about that test as well? Good question. I intended not to go too deeply into the latency test during this webinar because um, it never really got accepted uh, within the clinic. But what you do with the latency test is that you look at the beginning of the reflex, the, the part where it builds up, and then um, you look at if the reflex is building up as quick as it should. Now there, there is indications that by looking at the, uh, the way the reflex builds up, you could also get an indication if there is a retrocochlear pathology, so a neurological problem. Now, as I said in daily clinical practice, um, it, it is never really recognized as being a valuable tool. And so it's, it's you could say, still in a research phase and, and, and not being used so much. Well, uh, we come at the end of our webinar. I would like to thank you all for participating today. Um, more information about tympanometry can be found at the Interacoustics Academy website. Thank you for now. Bye bye.